One of the greatest obstacles to crafting health and wellness is identifying and controlling inflammation. It's at the core of all complex and chronic diseases, and it's the driving mechanism that underlies the most common symptoms that people like you struggle to overcome. Join us as we explore cutting-edge science and research to give you the information and tools you need to create the quality of life you want and deserve. And now, here is the host of Inflammation Nation, Dr. Stephen Nosworthy. So let's switch the conversation a little bit away from protein, fats, carbohydrates, and, and these calculations and setting different targets. And let's talk about quality of food because, um, you know, there are, there are certain ways that you can get yourself into trouble, even if you have all your numbers correct. If you're choosing poor quality food, you can actually invoke some kind of an inflammatory response simply by eating lower quality foods, lower protein, lower quality fats, lower quality carbohydrates. And the whole point of this is, let's start with this understanding. If you are systemically inflamed for some reason, and there are many different reasons that you can be inflamed, inflammation can then increase the rate at which you store body fat, and it also shuts down the efficiency of how well you can break body fat down and then use that for fuel. And so as a general rule, the inflamed person is going to accumulate more body fat over time. And until that inflammatory cascade is controlled and the mechanisms or the triggers that drive it are eliminated or modified enough, then weight loss becomes very, very difficult. Hence the problem of difficult weight loss where people are consuming low calories, they're in the gym all the time, and they're killing themselves, but they're not losing weight. In fact, some cases they're actually gaining weight. So what does quality of food have to do with it? Well, let's, let me just put aside the argument for now about the difference between things like hormone, antibiotic free meats and all that kind of stuff. I want to focus on healthy or good quality carbohydrates and choices in terms of healthy fats, because when it comes to understanding the roles that different, the different proteins, I'm sorry, the different macronutrients play in this whole process. Uh, we look at protein as being our structural component, our repair component, and even though it does give us a caloric value, we don't really look at it as our primary fuel source because we're getting so much more coming from either carbs or fats, and certainly the combination of two of those as we prioritize one over the other. So let's talk about carbohydrates. Uh, there are certain things that you should probably think about avoiding right off the bat, and I know nobody's going to want to hear this, um, but as a general rule, we look at things like grains as being pro-inflammatory. And at the very least, I think you should consider going gluten-free. And we'll probably do an entire series on gluten just by itself and the role it can play in inflammation, particularly brain-based or neuroinflammation. Plenty of research on that in the medical literature and plenty of uh, uh, experience on my end as well as other clinicians of how much gluten can devastate people who are predisposed to having that kind of sensitivity. But nevertheless, in terms of dietary design, you know, thinking about the content of diets, uh, perhaps the best starting place in terms of the content of your diet might be the paleo diet. And the paleo diet is traditionally moderate protein, and depending on which version you're looking at, uh, you know, you could prioritize carbohydrates over fats or vice versa. But nevertheless, um, the paleo diet is by necessity a grain-free diet. And that is not necessarily because grains are evil in and of themselves, but they do tend to be pro-inflammatory. And a world, and in a world where um, a lot of grains and cereals and those types of things are stored and transported and sold in bulk, um, there is one potential issue, and that is food that is laden with things called mycotoxins. And these are basically toxins that are produced by different mold species that tend to live inside the bins and the storage compartments and they feed off some of the fuel sources and the carbohydrates of the grains themselves and so you can consume grains and actually end up with a mold toxicity issue without having been exposed to it say in a sick building syndrome that's one way that you can get yourself into trouble 
uh, when you when you choose poor quality carbohydrates. And you said, well, maybe if we sprout them, if we soak them, if we prepare them properly, yeah, that's going to work for some people. But the vast majority of people, particularly those who are interested in controlling inflammation and interested in improving, improving their metabolic health, are probably going to do better just to avoid grains altogether. You say, okay, well, that's great. I'll just replace my grains with potatoes. <laughs> well, then we start to run into some other issues with what we call nightshade vegetables. And nightshades would be tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, peppers like green and red peppers, um, zucchini, uh, not zucchini, my, my apologies. Um, it, but the issue with nightshades are a protein called lectins. And, and lectins are uh, protein structures that actually bind to carbohydrates on a cell surface and they can invoke an inflammatory response. And in fact, uh, in the world of autoimmune research, there is a lot of uh, potential cross-reactivity between foods that contain high amounts of lectins and creating antibody responses or autoimmune responses against certain self-tissue targets, whether that's your thyroid or your brain or your pancreas or the cartilage in your joints or so on. And it varies depending on the lectin as well as the food. And so as a general rule, what we want to do to try to lower the inflammatory load coming from carbohydrates in the diet is to get rid of the grains and to eliminate or greatly reduce our lectin consumption by getting rid of nightshade vegetables. And again, that's potatoes, um, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. Now, there are other foods that also contain lectins, and those would be nuts and seeds and beans and legumes. And you're thinking, wow, doc, you are like going against everything that any nutritionist had ever told me or anything that I've read about the health and, you know, eating nuts and seeds and we're supposed to be eating legumes and the fiber is good and the protein content is good. Yeah, all of that might be true on some level, but remember what our goal is. Our goal is, number one, not to vilify large food groups just because we feel like it. The goal is to manipulate diet as a variable to create a specific outcome. And as long as your nutritional bases are being covered, eliminating grains, for example, is not going to be an issue, despite what some people might say. Eliminating nuts and seeds, eliminating uh, beans and legumes is not going to be an issue because you can get everything that you need for all aspects of your health and wellness from other parts of the carbohydrate world and certainly if you're eating nutrient dense animal proteins and consuming healthy fats. The reality is from a physiological standpoint, carbohydrates are not an obligatory fuel source, meaning your body has zero need for carbohydrates. Let me say it again, your body has zero need for carbohydrates. You can get every nutrient that you need from animal proteins as well as from healthy fats. And if you think, well, what about, you know, I need fiber for my microbiome and all that kind of stuff. Certainly fiber can have a tremendous impact on your microbiome, but your microbiome can survive on other things. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the degree of health and wellness that we see in some of these ancestral diets that we see with the Inuit or the Hadza or different groups, ethnic groups that we see around the world that either have um, limited carbohydrate availability or they only have seasonal carbohydrate availability of certain kinds. Now, where we are right now with research in the microbiome, excuse me, is the suggestion that the more diverse our plant and vegetable intake is from a, from a fiber standpoint and a fermentability standpoint, the more diverse our microbiome will become. And in general, we believe that a more diverse microbiome leads to better health outcomes. And I believe that to be true. But sometimes you are, um, you know, doing one thing to with a very specific purpose, which may mean that you end up not doing certain things that might be applicable down the road. And I'm just saying that for the short term, we have to make some concessions if we're trying to reach certain goals. My point is not to convince you to become a true carnivore in the sense that you're eating carbohydrates or no carbohydrates and nothing but animal proteins and fat. My point is to highlight that we have this misconception that there is an absolute obligatory need for carbohydrates in the diet, and there is not. We can't that say that about protein. We cannot say that about fats. There are certain fats and certain amino acids that we cannot get on our own. We can make glucose 
which is generally why we eat carbohydrates, because we want glucose as a fuel source, we can make glucose on our own. We can make it out of other things. We can make it out of amino acids. We can make it out of ketones. We can make it on our own, so we don't necessarily need to consume it. So let's get back to quality of carbohydrates. And, uh, and let me reiterate, you know, going grain free, particularly gl gluten free, as well as a lot of the grains that uh, tend to replace gluten in gluten free products. And now I'm thinking about it, I'm going to have to do a whole series on gluten in that whole picture. Um, but that'll have to wait for a different time. Um, so going grain free, like the paleo style diet, I think is an excellent starting point. And then um, looking at limiting uh, lectin containing foods. So that would be your nightshade vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, and legumes. Now, if you want to be really fancy, you can go online and you can Google low lectin nuts and seeds, and you can come up with a couple that you're probably okay adding into your diet. But I would say this to you, if you have inflammatory process, particularly if you have autoimmune diseases and you experience frequent flare-ups that take you a while to get out of, you don't have control of your immune system and your inflammatory cascade. You need to do everything you can in the short term to stop that. You now, while we might think, well, there's just supplements I can take for it, so I'll take supplements and I'll continue eating those things in my diet and I'll just use the supplements to control the inflammation caused by the things that I'm eating. But here's a fundamental truth. You cannot, let me repeat, you cannot out-supplement a bad diet. <laughs> you just can't do it. You can't out-supplement a bad lifestyle. You just can't do it, right? So just kind of take that to heart and think about some of the changes that you might consider making. Now, what about healthy oils? Well, let's talk about the unhealthy stuff first. You know, again, uh, back in the 80s when, when the high-carb, low-fat craze came and certain fats became vilified. You know, back, I, I remember growing up, my mother cooked with butter all the time. Uh, my grandparents certainly did. They cooked with lard and bacon grease and all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden came Crisco. And, you know, the lard went out the door and Crisco came in. Crisco was vegetable shortening. In the past several decades, there's been all this in information out there about how plant and vegetable based oils are healthy for us and saturated fats, things like lard um, and uh, bacon fat and pork fat and duck fat, all these things, old fashioned butter are really not healthy for you. And, and I'm telling you, that's absolutely not true. In fact, I would say it's actually the opposite. That when I work with clients who have inflammatory conditions, which pretty much all of them do, we start talking about this portion of their diet. Uh, my main thing is I tell them you, you've got to get away from the industrial seed oils and vegetable oils because those things have very uh, low heat points. They generate a lot of free radicals when you heat them. And that means that the free radicals then are going to trigger an inflammatory cascade in your body. And so what we want to do is we want to eliminate the use of things like canola oil, corn oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, and, and rapeseed oil as well um, in our effort to control our inflammatory load. And we replace those things. Let me give you a couple of options. If you're not dairy sensitive, some people are, some people are not then butter is a great option. And I'm not talking margarine, I'm talking about butter. And if you're in an area where you can get uh, things like Amish butter, probably even better. Ghee, which is clarified butter, is also a great option. But don't be afraid of bacon fat and duck fat and pork fat and lard. In fact, you can go online these days and there are companies now that specialize in um, in creating these, uh, you know, call them gourmet fats, if you will, um, Epic is one company that does it and you can buy jars. They'll ship it right to your door. Um, they'll, you can get jars of high quality animal based fats that have, they're very heat stable, which means when you cook with them, they don't generate the free radicals that cause inflammation. And of course the flavor is absolutely fantastic. So consider this, is that sometimes you might have your macronutrients right, your total calories right, but sometimes the choices that you're making in terms of the quality of carbohydrates and fats could be causing an inflammatory response that is working against your weight loss efforts. Remember, when you're inflamed for whatever reason, including the quality of your diet, that inflammation does two things. It increases the probability that you're going to store body fat and it decreases the probability that you're going to break it down and burn it for fuel 
even if you're in the gym five, six days a week, putting in all the work and paying your dues. Thank you so much for listening to the Inflammation Nation. If you found this episode valuable, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Be the first to know when a new episode drops so that you can stay on top of your game. It also helps others like you find the answers they need. And why not head over to my main website, drnoseworthy.com, that's drnoseworthy.com, to explore my personalized functional medicine coaching programs, submit a question to the podcast, maybe take a quiz, or even reach out to me using the contact form that you can find there. We'll see you next time.